yo, what it do, y'all? Welcome back to the View Askew Review Series. This is the second installment, guys, and we're talking about none other than one of my favorite films of all time, my favorite View Askew movie, Mallrats Baby, as you can see from the thumbnail, 1995, actually released on October 20th of 95, to be exact, and... What else can I say about this film other than plenty of other things I'm about to get into? But before we do, hashtag more cowbell. Click that bell button right next to subscribe and then click the subscribe button so that way every time we drop a new piece of content, you get an alert. YouTube lets you know. Algorithm, all that good jazz. Much love to all of you guys out there. And if you listen in on the podcast feed, much love to all of you out there. We are going to have the view askew series over there on the podcast feed don't put every single review necessarily up there but we wanted to do this one over there for sure especially i figured if i'm going to be doing kevin smith movies might as well pay some respect to the podcast space so that's why we're going to be doing that guys so with no further ado let's get right into the film itself man and i always say this film was extremely ahead of its time because it really was one of the first real nerdy films out there really celebrating and really going into comic book culture and people in that kind of space that love that type of content you know what i'm saying and back in 95 it wasn't necessarily the coolest thing ever to like marvel or dc or superheroes or science fiction or graphic novels or any of that stuff you know what i'm saying it, ne it wasn't necessarily as trendy as it is today for us millennials coming up in the uh, mid and late 2000s. You know what I'm saying? It's a completely different time now when it comes to being a nerd. You know what I mean? Revenge of the Nerds back in the 80s and all that kind of stuff. It was a completely different perception of nerd type of culture. You know what I'm saying? Everything that we do here at Phantom Frequency would not be something. It, this would be even more niche than it is right now. And technically, it has potential not to be because of how popular um, nerdy, you know, fandom and all that kind of content really is today. So it's just crazy how things have changed so much in that regard. And that translated directly to the initial um, failure of this film in and of itself when it comes to box office and all that kind of stuff. It really just straight up bombed at the box office, man. And it just didn't make the money back then. And with Kevin Smith coming on his um, directorial debut, and some people would still say his best film... Clerks in 94, just a year prior, or like maybe maybe two years ago, two years prior, he did the film and it dropped in 94, something like that. But by the time it came out in 94, he was becoming quickly a big name in the industry in a certain sense. You know what I mean? He was becoming like a known name. I'm not exactly sure how much pull or how much power in Hollywood he had gained from that film to this film, but I just know from a little bit of the research I've done and from interviews Kevin Smith has done in the past that this film just was not initially like really successful out the gate like that. 25 years later, like I, I, I'm overjoyed about it. You got to remember like when it came out, nobody liked this movie and I was told you're bad and it flopped and my career was over. So the fact that 25 years later, people still care about it, like means everything, but it's a mind bender. You know, like I just remember coming to grips with the death of my second movie. Like that's, it's a big deal, man. Like I, when they op we open, I've told the story many times, opening weekend, Jim Jacks, one of the producers, calls me on Saturday to give me the box office grosses because we didn't have the internet. He had to like call in and a company collected the grosses, I guess Universal's company, and then gave him a, an idea, a rough estimate of what we did on Friday. So I said, uh, how do we do? And he goes, we did $400,000. And I was like, on what screen? And he goes, that was on all of the screens. And we were on like 500 screens. People just really didn't quite get it in the general uh, movie going audience is what I mean. You know what I'm saying? Because there's plenty of comic book nerds and people like that running around in the 90s. They were just more on the fringes of the different cliques that kind of make up the more popular side of society. You know what I'm saying? So those people went and supported it. Anyone that was a big Kevin Smith fan going in from Clerks, they probably heard about it and went to go see it and other teenagers of the like that were mall rats themselves that like going to the mall to chill because that was kind of a space to kind of kick it back in those days. So those people probably went out and supported the film, but it just didn't get enough love necessarily to get it way over the top in the way that, that they wanted to. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Kevin Smith's sophomore outing didn't really hit 
on all cylinders like that for the overall uh, reception. But I always say it's my favorite Kevin Smith film, man. And I think it is so damn ahead of its time for not just the reason I said earlier, but just how much it resonates with the future generation that was to come um, after it, which is my generation, you know, us 90s kids and all that. We really championed this film and made it into the cult classic that it is today. And the reason why people on tpublic.com are making shirts like this and I'm able to even purchase it this many years later, it's literally almost as old as I am. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a 26, 27-year-old movie. So the fact that it persists to this day definitely shows just how in touch with the people Kevin Smith really is as a writer and filmmaker, you know what I'm saying? And the way that his films just continue to resonate with future generations and are always going to be timeless in my mind, you know what I'm saying? Now, the only element you could really point to maybe in that regard that maybe might not be is just the the more edgy humor, but for me... I ain't bothered by that, you know what I'm saying? I'm not the most sensitive person you're going to meet when it comes to those type of things. I'm not saying that all PC culture is bad, anything like that, but I do think when you go a little bit too far with that stuff, you start to stifle people's creativity in a certain way that I think is a little overboard sometimes, what is not necessarily the hugest deal in the world. And you have a right to be offended, as I've stated earlier in this review series, and I'm going to continue to do so in this particular review series because of the content of those films. I'm very aware of it, but you have a right to be offended, but everyone else has a right to enjoy the film because anyone that really knows Kevin Smith's really essence as a person and what he's really about knows that he's a really good guy and isn't about any of that kind of stuff. And honestly, his third film, Chasing Amy, is a much more progressive film than even some of the stuff that comes out today. And that film's nearly 25 years old in and of itself right there. And I actually think this is the 25th anniversary of Chasing Amy which will be the next installment of this review series. So keep your eyes open for that. And I think people that think that maybe things aren't progressive necessarily in the Kevin Smith filmography, namely the View Askew universe, definitely check out Chasing Amy and some of the other stuff. There's definitely more nuance than there appears to be uh, with the naked eye. You know what I'm saying? So I really love all of that stuff. And just the humor itself is just fucking hilarious, man. And when it comes to the cast and the humor and the way that everything's coming together with this thing, it's a blast, man, because the basic premise of Mallrats really is that two teenage guys, namely Jason Lee's character, Brody Bruce, and Jeremy London's character of T.S. Quint, they're both having girl troubles for totally separate reasons with their significant others, and they both get dumped in the same day. T.S. Quint gets into this whole, like, whole thing with his girlfriend, Brandy uh, Svenning, I believe, yes, who is at an event held by her dad uh, the night before um, the big uh, taping of the dating show at the mall where most of the movie takes place. But before they get to the mall in the second and third act, the first, uh, really the first initial sequence of the film, the extended version that is, sets up that her dad, Brandy Spenning's dad, Mr. Spenning, is over there trying to get funding for his TV network to do this dating show in order for him to get out of syndicated television or to get out of uh, uh, local television into syndicated big network TV. So this is his big shot to get that funding, which he's supposed to get a check from this uh, mayor lady or whatever. But everything goes awry because T.S. is up there dressed up as a, uh, as a Civil War guy, I believe, or something like that. And he ends up getting his little fake musket caught in his girlfriend's hair when they get into a conversation about them supposedly taking a trip to Florida. But once all that goes awry and they start arguing about that because she's going to go do her dad's ga dating show, even though she's obviously dating T.S., they get into a whole um, a whole big ordeal trying to get her hair from being caught in the, in the little fake musket or whatever. And then it ends up going off and he ends up shooting the blank out and everyone thinks it's a real life shooting. And then all the, uh, all the damn uh, secret agents or whatever, you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying? Uh, all the uh, the Secret Service agents that are with the mayor or whatever the hell or her name or whoever the hell she is, and they're all they're all flipping out, and then they all go try to arrest them too, and end up getting her implicated into something until they realize it's all a big misunderstanding, and then that ends up getting the lady injured in the process of the guard trying to get her out of the way and fucking throwing her over the damn table and trying to hide her and shit. He ends up 
uh, injuring her neck, which gets her all pissed off as she rips up the check. There goes Mr. Sven- Mr. Svenning's funding for the show, and he ends up hating T.S. even more than he already does. And then Brandy ends up breaking up with T.S. because he overreacts and gets upset at the situation of them not going to Florida where he was planning on proposing. So then we jump on over to our boy Brody Bruce, played by the great Jason Lee and his girlfriend Renee, and he's essentially the typical, you know, very unromantic, you know, kind of a little bit of an asshole type boyfriend that isn't really sensitive to her needs or anything like that and is a little bit clueless to that type of stuff and can be just a bit of an asshole in general, although likable and is a great guy deep down at heart. He can be a bit of an asshole, so that definitely comes through. And Renee, after being so bored and jaded with their relationship, ends up dumping his ass with a letter and doesn't even tell him in person, leaves after they just get down and dirty. And then he ends up getting dumped right then and there and ends up framing the damn letter that T.S. ends up seeing later on when they meet up the next day. So everything hits, uh, all the shit hits the fan for them there. And then... Brody gets the bright idea of hitting up the mall in order to cheer up T.S. and go continue his comic book collection. And then all chaos breaks out and hell breaks loose from there, man. But like I said, what I mentioned the cast earlier, so many great members of the cast here, man. Like I said, you got Shannon Doherty playing Renee, Jason Lee's boyfriend, and then you got... Uh, almost forgot to write her name down. There it is. Claire Forlani playing Brandy Svenning. You don't see her a lot these days, but she was definitely very good. And then, obviously, like I mentioned, Shannon Doherty, who I believe was in Charmed, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to look that up real quick, because I think she was. But overall, like I said, super dope cast on this. We got Ben Affleck playing the douchebag guy that pl- that works at uh, the, the, you know, the suit surplus or whatever, but yeah, Shannon Doherty did star in Charmed, I thought so, so we got her up in here, and then you got Ben Affleck, like I said, and you also got the great Stan the Man Lee as himself in his very first on-screen cameo of all time, way before Marvel started doing it, my man Kevin Smith got, uh, got on the script, and it all came full circle, and then just for shits and gigs real quick to take a tangent, in Captain Marvel back in 2019, they had a little Stan Lee cameo of him reading the Mallrat script on the bus in the little scene in Captain Marvel because it took place in the 90s. So that was a cool little nod. And Kevin Smith totally uh, geeked out about that on his podcast. He was so excited about how that came full circle. And he became an Easter egg in Marvel growing up a fan of Marvel. It's just it's just so cool to see synergy and to see things come around like that. I just love that as a fan. But anyways, moving on here with the review. And then you got Jay and Silent Bob, of course. Brody man, Nucci Nucci's. And look at this shit, the mad fat chick killer. Can't believe how fast word travels in this time. Excellent. What's he doing? A uh, shithead here watched Empire and Jedi last week and ever since he's been trying to do the Jedi mind trick. Crazy fuck thinks he'll levitate shit with his thoughts. Knock it off. The force is strong with this one. Dude, don't encourage him. Played by Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes, the two best friends up in here as the Goofy Stoners themselves, man. And there's so much fun to be had with Mall Rats, dude. Like I said, the whole thing with uh, Willem, played by uh, played by Ethan Souple, where he can't see the sailboat I in the little... The three-dimensional uh, picture. Oh, yeah, look, it's a sailboat. You saw it too? Damn it! What? I've been staring at this thing for a week now, from opening till closing, and I can't see a goddamn thing! You got- picture thing where all the squiggly designs ends up making up a picture the more you stare at it, and he's been looking at it for days, and his dumb ass can't see it, and I'm just dying, bro, because his ass has been there for days, and if someone starts talking to him, it breaks his concentration, and he has to start over again, and everyone just walks up, and within seconds is like, oh, look, a sailboat! And he's just like, shut up, you damn kids. And there's this one kid's like, oh, a schooner. You dumb bastard. I'm like, yo, what'd you just say to that kid? It's not a schooner. It's a sailboat. A schooner is a sailboat. <laughs> the Easter Bunny's fake. <laughs> I was like, damn, dude, come on. Easter's tomorrow, bro. Like, damn. Like, this guy's cold-blooded over here, man. And then all the little gadgets that Silent Bob has when he's got the damn... Uh, Batman, uh, fucking, uh, 
the damn gun shooting out the swing and everything like that. And him with the fucking the wings and everything like that, man. It's so hilarious. And he keeps breaking, uh, crashing into Joey Lauren, Joey Lauren Adams dressing room in the damn thing. And she ends up being in there as a character named Gwen Turner. And she's trying to go over there and try on some panties. And his ass keeps busting into the damn fitting room. So she's like, well, I'm getting out of there. And then she ends up running into Bruce. I mean, Bruce. Oh, my gosh. Brody and T.S. later. And it's funny enough, T.S. is actually her ex-boyfriend in this thing. And cheated on him, apparently, several different times, even in public before, where they all witnessed it. And I'm like, damn, dude. This girl, Gwen, was the worst girlfriend ever man like her and karen they were some cheating ass bitches man and it makes sense and it, may, it totally makes sense man a lot of these girls in jersey these guys are dealing with i mean jeez the worst god damn when it comes to the uh infidelity stuff i'm like jeez dude my lord like at least those guys in jersey god damn but anyway but damn but it was funny enough how joey joey lauren adams such a i don't know why i'm getting tongue-tied with that it's funny how Joey, she's uh she's in this film and chasing Amy, but not playing the same characters, but they know different characters throughout Clerks and Mallrats. So very interesting stuff. But we'll get more into that in the third installment of the review series coming up here real soon. But yeah, man, it's pretty funny seeing how all that comes around, man. And I have just so much fun with this film. And when it comes to the Stan Lee cameo, of course, so much fucking fun, man. So much fun. And I love the whole thing of of T.S. hiring him to go talk to Brody to get him to come to his senses to want to win his girl back and using the whole Spider-Man with uh, Mary Jane solilo soliloquy and the whole lie that he makes up that he based all the Marvel characters off of different emotions that uh, Stan Lee was going through and a lot of that stuff came from his initial heartbreak of the one that got away type of deal. Even though we all know he was married to his wife Joni for decades, man. You know what I'm saying? So it was pretty funny how they spun that story around. Because I remember watching this the first time being like, wait a minute. I don't remember Stan ever having something like that. And I was like, oh, I see what you're doing there. Nice. I see where you're at. But yeah, man. So much fun there with Stan the Man Lee. I'm going to miss seeing him, man, so much. I already do. I, I always will. And it was such a pleasure getting to meet him several years ago at LA Comic Con when it was still called Stan Lee's Kamikaze. The last year actually as a matter of fact they called it that so it was great to get to meet him in person real quick luckily i just got to meet him real quick so that was a really really dope blessing and i'm just so honored to have met him and i just missed the hell out of him and much love rest in paradise to the great stan lee man gonna miss that guy forever and thank you for all the contributions you have made to pop culture sir and all the ways you've changed all of us nerds changed our lives forever but Moving on uh, from there, man. Uh, I really love the ending sequence, too, at the actual dating game show after they get the two guys stoned and have them knocked out and thrown out. And then T.S. and Brody end up taking their place. What, what kind of noises would you make? Uh, 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 uh. No, I, I think that's kind of personal. I don't think I should answer that. And I love the whole banter and thing that goes back and forth between them two and Brian O'Halloran's character, who's supposed to be... Uh, <coughs> but yeah, the whole thing with uh, Brian O'Halloran's character being suitor number three and all the fun banter and jokes that go back and forth like, did he come or what? Jesus, stop asking. Some things you don't need to mention in public, man. <laughs> That's a bunch of horse shit. No one's going to do that. You sound like a guy that would beg for sex. And trust me. We, we know our own. <laughs> I was like, God damn, Brody, stop fucking, stop, uh, stop roasting this guy so bad. What did he ever do to you? And I love how Jay's just watching backstage like, oh my God, man, this shit is fucked up. Tell him, dog. <laughs> it's just so fun, man. I love how fucking Silo Bob's back there trying to mess with the tape machine to get the tape in there to put, put the incriminating evidence for Ben Affleck's character, and for those of you that have seen the film, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those who haven't, check this thing out, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, because let me say, it's quite fucked up. Let me say that. But, moving along here, and I love how Silent Bob is just, he's, he's the tech guy, man. He, he's got the gadgets, he's got everything you need, he's got all the handy skills, he's, all, he's a handyman, he's an everyman, he's a renaissance man. We need more respect putting the name of Silent Bob, y'all. I swear. People just act like he's a slacker stoner, but my man's kind of smart. I think Jay really ruins his uh, his street cred, you know? 
because I, f- I feel like Silent Bob doesn't get enough love out here, man. I feel like I feel, I feel like people be hating. But anyways, moving along here, yo. But yeah, man, I just love the whole ending thing with the game show and all that shit, man. It's just so hilarious, and I love how at the end of the film, obviously, Renee and Brody get back together, and T.S. and Clara get back together. They go off to Florida. They get engaged right there when the shark comes up in the Jaws, uh, in the Jaws portion of the uh, behind-the-scenes uh, ride thing at Universal Studios. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And then Brody becomes the new talk show host of The Tonight Show with Renee as his band leader. Questlove, get over, bro. Renee's coming in here. She took a job, but I'm just playing. She was probably in, uh, probably happened before he was in there. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah, I don't even know if any of y'all who watched this even got that joke, but it's for me. But anyways, yeah, man. So I just love the whole hilarious ending. And then Ben Affleck's ass gets arrested and, you know, he, you know, he ends up getting taken advantage of himself, so I dig that. And it's just fun stuff, man. Willem finally saw that sailboat, man. He finally saw that sailboat. It was beautiful. Beautiful stuff, dude. And that, and that Easter Bunny, he got his, too. All right, who's next? It's hot in this goddamn suit. Uh, hey, guys. Hey, guys. Get away in line like everybody else. What the hell is this? This is for Brody. Oh, what? Ah, you ah, 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 Come on, ah, come on. Jay and Silent Bob kicked that ass, boy. Beat that ass, bro. But yeah, man, what else could I say more about this film? I absolutely love Mall Rats. And if you haven't seen this movie, I probably spoiled the hell out of it quite a bit. But if you haven't seen it, it is about as old as a lot of people watching this video if you were born in the mid-90s or later. So it might even be older than you. So go check this thing out as soon as you can. Buy it on Blu-ray today. Amazon, Target, I don't care. Or, or rent it on Amazon. However you got to do it. But check this thing out today. And make sure you stick around for the rest of this View Askew review series. We're doing every single Kevin Smith View Askew film leading right into Clerks 3 next month in September. I'm hoping I can get those tickets in time so that way I don't have to try to catch the show later because I would love to get that initial theater run in September for Clerks 3. It is literally my second most anticipated film for the rest of this year and one of my most anticipated films of the year in general. So I can't wait to talk about that, but we're going to talk about all the films in that series leading into it. Next week, we're going to have 1997's Chasing Amy as the next installment. Joey Lord and A- Lauren Adams. You got Ben Affleck up in there. Matt Damon makes a quick cameo. We got a lot of fun to be had. A lot of progressive conversations to get into. It's going to be a lot of fun here on the channel. And thank you for checking out any of our other content if you have before. And if this is your first time visiting, welcome to Fandom Frequency. We talk about it all around here, baby. But we're going to be moving into more niche movies and TV shows as well. So make sure you stick around for that. We're covering everything in the world of pop culture. So make sure you stick around, you stay tuned, you don't sleep. And I'll catch you on the next one, guys. Peace.